Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the History of Medicine and Nursing webinar series hosted by the School of Medicine and the School of Nursing and Midwifery here at RCS Bahrain. Next slide, please. So just to um, run you through how the webinars organised, um, just a, a very short welcome from myself, um, Professor Rebecca, as Head of School of Nursing and Midwifery here at RCSI. And then I'll be handing over to Dr. Hussain um, to provide the introduction. Uh, then we'll be introducing you to our first speaker of the evening, uh, Dr. Fariba El Darazi, and we're delighted to welcome her to the event. Um, Dr. Hussain will moderate the Q&A sessions, and then we'll go to our next speaker, Professor John Flood. And uh, we will finish with a final Q&A session. Thank you. Next slide, please. So, so welcome everyone to uh, the first in this uh, webinar series for the this academic year. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, be able to uh, introduce the webinar series uh, to you. Next slide, please. I just want to say, you know, why is it important as um, nurses and doctors, uh, medical students and nursing students, why is it important and why is it valuable to look at our history? And I just wanted to share with you uh, a couple of quick um, messages. So the, the history of nursing and medicine is wider than the study of just the education and training and practice of uh, medical staff and nurses. It looks back, our history looks at encompassing the experience of individuals and groups, movements and organisations, religion and war, culture and gender, politics and social ideas. These all influence the develop, uh, development of nursing and medical practice. And many of us will, will know that quite often um, advancements and developments that we make in medicine and nursing practice are very much influenced by unfortunate and tragic events such as war and trauma. But on the positive side of that, we learn a lot through um, nursing and practice, uh, medical practice in times of crisis, such as the COVID pandemic. So just focusing on nursing for a moment, if I may, uh, there are a number of ways of making nursing visible in the eyes of policymakers and the public. And it's important to link past events and the achievements of our predecessors to the issues confronting health and nursing today. And that's taken from the Royal College of Nursing, History of Nursing Forum. Thank you. Next slide, please. So I'd now have great pleasure in introducing my colleague, Dr. Hussein, and we'll be handing over to him. Yeah, thank you, Professor uh, Rebecca, and welcome everybody uh, again. So before I introduce Dr. Fariba, I would like to go through the uh, housekeeping. Next slide, please. So just to let you know that the event of today is uh, recorded. And make sure that you connect either from your uh, laptop or from your phone. And as uh, Professor Rebecca mentioned, we will have uh, questions after each uh, after each talk. And you can post your questions in the top of the Microsoft team. You will find um, a camera icon. Next to the camera icon, there is a, a circle with a question mark. You click and post your questions, and I'm going to, uh, you know, ask this question to the uh, speaker. Uh, just to uh, let you know also that there will be slight delay in the broadcast, so please uh, bear with us. So uh, I will uh, like to welcome again uh, Dr. Um, uh, Fariba uh, and give uh, a short bio uh, uh, of her. She's the former 
coordinator of health workforce development and regional advisor for nursing midwifery and allied health personnel at regional office for the Eastern Mediterranean region belong to the WHO. She served in this post for almost 15 years from 2000 to 2015. And I think in this post, she uh, uh, play a key role in development and strengthening nursing within the health system of uh, Eastern Mediterranean region uh, countries. Dr. Fariba had contributed significantly to the development of nursing profession in Bahrain and in the GCC and the Eastern Mediterranean region. And at national level, Dr. Fariba was one of the first three uh, Bahraini tutor who joined the first school of nursing in 1974 and she uh, played a key role in transforming the uh, nursing school to College of Health Sciences which is now uh, under uh, University of um, Bahrain. Dr. Fariba also uh, was the director of uh, training directorate at Ministry of Health and she appointed in 1990 and I think in this role she uh, uh, played an important role in the development of the policy and plan for human resources for health at national level in the country. Uh, at community uh, level, she was the first president uh, of Bahrain Nursing uh, Society, which is now changed to Bahrain Nursing and Midwifery uh, Society. In addition to that, Dr. Fariba uh, served as a member of uh, Supreme Council of Health in the Kingdom of Bahrain from 2016 and 2019. And at GCC level, uh, she coordinated the work of the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, Countries Technical uh, Committee on Nursing during uh, its uh, first establishment. So Dr. Fariba uh, awarded her uh, PhD from University of Illinois, United States of America, and she is the first national in the GCC to uh, obtain a PhD uh, in nursing. Currently, Dr. Fariba is doing a lot of consultancies and she is available to uh, lead the future uh, leaders in Bahrain and at uh, GCC level. So I welcome you, uh, Dr. Fariba. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hussain, for this introduction. Thank you, Professor Rebecca, uh, and welcome uh, to Bahrain. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, dear participants in the webinar, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored, really honored, to present during this series of uh, webinars on history. Uh, which is very important, I think, uh, especially for our young generation of nurses and health professionals. The title of my presentation is Shaping Nursing in the Eastern Mediterranean Region through Bahrain's Nursing Leadership. And I would like to also congratulate uh, RCSI Bahrain for this uh, important uh, initiative, reflecting on the history of nursing and uh, health uh, in general uh, in our countries and in the region. The content of my presentation today will be, I'll talk a little bit about early days and then a role of uh, Bahrain's nursing leadership in the GCC. Uh, WHO and uh, ICN. Next slide, please. Yeah. The Eastern Mediterranean region of the World Health Organization consists <coughs> oh, sorry, of 22 member states and territories, and it includes the six GCC uh, countries as member states, including Bahrain, the Emro region has a population of 679 million people. 
the collaboration with WHO started with in Bahrain with WHO started very early. In the early 80s, the nursing division at the College of Health Sciences then was uh, Ms. Fadwa Afara was the chairperson of the nursing division at the college, represented Bahrain in the Eastern Mediterranean region task force in Geneva, which discussed professional regulation. This was in the early 80s. Also, the nursing division collaborated on various projects then uh, with WHO, such as the project on development of performance assessment for nurses uh, and midwives working in maternal child health for all categories uh, of nurses and midwives then. Also at that time, the uh, Bahrain, not only the College of Health Sciences, but all the nursing services, whether it was in Salmania or psychiatric hospital or the maternity uh, hospitals, we received many fellows from the countries, from the countries of the region to come. They came and learned about Bahrain's experience in nursing in various fields and specialties through the WHO fellowship program. Also, when the college was established in 1976, the College of Health Sciences, after a few years, the Center for Educational Development became a regional center for teacher training. And many teachers who worked in the schools and colleges of nursing in the region were trained in Bahrain, especially from the GCC countries. Many of the nurses who are leading now in the GCC countries, they had their education as educators or their BS degrees or their specialties in the area of mental health, community, emergency in, in Bahrain. <clears throat> now I will talk about a very important uh, initiative. As you know, the six countries of the GCC uh, have a lot of collaboration together. And then in 1992, uh, one day I'll tell you the story, His Excellency, uh, then Mr. Jawad al arayad the Minister of Health, asked two of the nurses uh, who were working in different fields in the ministry and the college to prepare a proposal, a two-page proposal on the importance of establishing a GCC Nursing Technical Committee. And His Excellency asked the team to put the terms of reference of this committee and why it was important. And he gave the team 24 hours to prepare the proposal. He said, tomorrow night I am traveling to Doha to be at the GCC Ministers of Health Council meeting. So I need to submit this proposal. The meeting was held in Qatar uh, between 11 to 13 January 1992. I spoke a little bit about the proposal, how it was developed. So a key message is here that we should not lose any opportunity if we are requested by policymakers to develop a, a proposal or any initiative to, to strengthen nursing and midwifery. If the Bahraini nursing team had said, no, we are busy, we have other commitments, we would have lost this golden opportunity. So the proposal was submitted by His Excellency and it was welcomed and accepted by all the ministers of health of the six GCC countries. And it was decided that the first meeting of the committee will be held in Bahrain and the meeting 
uh, happened in April in nine, April 1992. And then we had uh, the WHO regional advisor, Dr. Naam Abu Youssef, present in that meeting. So the GCC Nursing Technical Committee collaborated with WHO. We had uh, Ms. Layla Murad, who was the registrar in that meeting, Mrs. Khadija al goud Mrs. Siham Al-Sheikh, uh, Dr. Naima Al-Qasir, and uh, the late uh, Dr. Ibrahim Yagoub, who was the assistant under secretary for primary health care then. He opened uh, this meeting and we had around 15 to 20 observers, uh, nurses and midwives from different sectors in Bahrain, including the BDF. A decision was made in that meeting that we need to do a situational analysis of nursing and midwifery in the GCC. So we had a workshop, we had like a workshops and we identified the challenges facing nursing in the GCC uh, countries. So the, the ministers of health of the GCC agree that there is a need for a proper situational analysis of nursing in the GCC uh, countries. <clears throat> you see here is a picture of the first GCC nursing seminar that was held in uh, Abu Dhabi in the UAE and it was uh, under the theme strategies for improvement of nursing services in the GCC countries. It was held in between October and 2nd November 1993. And in that uh, meeting you see uh, in the picture His Excellency Dr. Saeed Ahmed Al Badi. He was a very visionary Minister of Health in the UAE. Uh, next to him uh, is uh, Dr. Abdurrahman Swelen, who was the uh, GCC director of the executive uh, uh, board. And uh, next to him is Ms. Fadwa Afara, who was the ICN consultant then, uh, and myself as the coordinator of the GCC technical committee. And far right, we have Dr. Fatma uh, Al Rifai. Uh, she was then the director of uh, nursing in the UAE. Now what happened in that meeting that we had, uh, you know, we were, uh, we were asked in Bahrain, the, the GCC board council asked Bahrain that to uh, formulate a scientific committee to prepare for this meeting. And the scientific committee was under the uh, supervision of the nursing division at the college, but the scientific committee included nurses and midwives from all the specialties of nursing in the Ministry of Health. So the service nurses and the nursing educators were in the scientific committee and the UAE established an organizing committee that dealt with the administrative uh, responsibilities for the seminar. Because then in the UAE nursing, because the national UAE nursing was very young and they did not, they needed the technical support to be able to hold, to hold this uh, seminar. And as uh, you know, at that time we didn't have emails and uh, social media, so it was not easy uh, to communicate. But because there was a will and there was commitment, we were able to have a very successful first GCC nursing seminar where the challenges were presented and the draft strategy was shared with the uh, participants of the of the seminar and from there uh, these seminars continued to uh, be held in different countries of the GCC. 
The recommendations of the seminar address education, regulation, general and there were gen and uh, services, and there were general recommendations uh, on the importance of having periodical every two years to have a seminar with a specific topic in one of the GCC uh, countries where nurses from the GCC could participate and share their experiences and present their papers. And one of the recommendation of the first seminar was to have a, a prize for the best nurse every two years to be presented to two nurses from education and services from each of the six countries during the uh, GCC conferences. Now, as I said earlier, the Council of Ministers of Health for GCC uh, decided or made a resolution that there is a need to have a proper situational analysis of the nursing profession and the future directions in the GCC countries. So a team of nurses were asked to, from all the six countries to develop the content and what the group of nurses uh, did from the six countries, uh, th this was a task force with membership from the six GCC countries. They worked on a framework for the book, a conceptual framework for the book, and developed surveys and co a questionnaire or several questionnaires actually, and did a disk review and analyzed the questionnaires and the disk review and were able to produce this publication, which was published in 1996. And it's a very important publication and it has seven chapters addressing the different components of nursing and midwifery. I forgot to tell you when the GCC nursing committee, technical committee was established, each member state, each of the six countries had two representatives in that committee, one representing the nursing services and another representing nursing education, because we believed that we cannot move forward without having those these two main components working uh, together. Now, what was Bahrain's nursing leadership uh, in GCC? What did we do? I spoke uh, a bit about the GCC technical committee and the Bahrain's input and leadership, not only the nursing leadership, but the, the leadership at the higher level, at the policy making level of the government in health. Advocacy. Advocacy was a very important tool for us. Whenever we were in meetings in the GCC or at the World Health Assembly and we met ministers of health from Oman or UAE or Saudi Arabia or Qatar uh, or Kuwait, we advocated uh, for nursing because all the GCC countries looked to nursing in Bahrain as a pioneer in the Gulf and they would would ask for our advice, not formally, you know, through networking. Uh, in one occasion, one of the ministers of health in one of the GCC countries, he said, I wish I had nurses like yourselves who could uh, uh, run the nursing, you know, services in, in my country. Uh, the, the nursing, the nurses from Bahrain who were in that meeting told the minister, Your Excellency, you have a national nurse so and so well educated and is working in education in a school of nursing. She has all the capabilities to become the director of nursing in your country. And this is how things moved and happened. We didn't wait for formal invitations 
to, to voice out our opinions and advice. Sharing of experience was very important. When the GCC Nursing Technical Committee was established, I remember clearly and fondly how Ms. Leila Murad, who was then the nurse registrar in Bahrain, shared with the countries of the GCC her experience and the experience of Bahrain in developing the nursing regulation, developing the information system for the nursing regulation. And uh, we, we were very proud and uh, we have to acknowledge that nursing was the first profession in Bahrain, a health profession that developed a proper system for regulation and licensure and uh, relicensure. We shared our experiences in education, our experiences in quality improvement, in doing nursing audits, and so on. The third item was the technical support. We provided, uh, I, I don't mean when I say we, I don't mean me, I mean whoever nurses with different specialties in Bahrain, whether nationals or nurses who were working, international nurses or expatriate nurses who were working in Bahrain. We provided technical support to our nursing colleagues in the GCC countries, whatever they needed, documents, uh, advice through phone, sending letters and so on. Another important uh, item or message or uh, success story is the documentation. You see that we documented, for example, the first GCC seminar that happened uh, after the seminar was uh, finished and completed. We had a four page uh, leaflet with the what happened in the seminar and the recommendation and it was distributed to everyone. The same thing with the uh, publication on the leadership on the situation analysis of nursing in the GCC. Now, what has been our involvement with the World Health Organization? I spoke earlier about the 80s. Uh, there was in 1994 a regional committee, which is the governing bodies for the WHO, the Eastern Mediterranean region, where 22 ministers of health meet and discuss important items. It was the 41st session of the WHO uh, governing body, regional committee that was held in Bahrain in October 1994. And then the regional advisor, Dr. Inam Abu Yusuf, had a presentation, technical paper, on how to plan for nursing at the national level. They asked the, His Excellency, the Minister of Health of Bahrain, uh, Mr. Jawad Al Araya, that we want a 10 minute presentation after Dr. Inam's presentation of our technical paper on Bahrain's experience in the development of nursing because we had such a pioneering and valuable experience. And that uh, during that meeting, the paper was uh, presented. Next slide, please. The paper that we presented addressed our achievements in improvement of nursing services, nursing education development. When I speak of nursing, I mean nursing and midwifery. Encouraging nationals to enter into nursing. What have we done? How nurses have become visible in the country? What approaches have we used? And what we have done to clarify the roles, the nurses' role to the public and to the uh, students. Also, the paper included 
uh, about our initiatives in community engagement on planning and nursing policy development, nursing regulation, continuous professional development, monitoring quality of nursing care, and establishment of nursing professional organizations. I want to mention now here also what happened in our collaboration with WHO. I remember that during that period, uh, Ms. Badri al Kuwaiti was seconded by the Ministry of Health to work with Dr. Anam Abu Youssef, who was the regional advisor for nursing at WHO, for six months so that she could gain experience about the work of WHO in nursing and also assist uh, Dr. Anam and learn from those experiences. These were some of the uh, initiatives that were done. And, and uh, I, I don't remember, uh, yeah, it was a secondment. The other thing was many of our uh, nurses worked on short-term WHO consultations with WHO, either uh, or they reviewed documents. We had many WHO fellows, we had many short-term consultants like Dr. Moza Swaleh, Dr. Lulua Jossin, uh, Sister Hakima Gulum, Sumaya, uh, Ms. Batul al uh, Ms. Badri al Kuwaiti, uh, I think, uh, and many uh, others who provided technical support to WHO. Now, this is a picture uh, of the global network of WHO collaborating centers for nursing meeting in Galveston, Texas in 1990. This was before the nursing division at the College of Health Sciences became designated as a collaborating center. Uh, I was asked to attend this uh, meeting to learn about the work of the uh, global network. Next. Uh, Slide, please. So, yeah. Dr. Fariba, uh, yeah. you have ten, 10 more minutes. Yeah, yeah. I, I will. I will finish. OK, Thank you. I have many pictures now. <laughs> OK. I think uh, the first time we had Bahraini nurses joining the Ministry of Health delegation headed by Ex His Excellency, the Minister of Health, Mr. Jawad Al Araya in 1991. And after that, it became a trend that nurses were included in the delegation that participated in the World Health uh, Assembly. So this is a picture of Dr. Naima Al Qasir and myself, and it was a very uh, important uh, learning experience for us in which we learned how to do interventions, how to prepare resolutions, and so on. Now, another milestone, which I think many of the uh, maybe nurses who are in, uh, participating in the webinar remember clearly, was that the global network of WHO collaborating center had its first conference in Bahrain in 1996. This was a very important uh, activity for us. Among, we have collaborating centers in all the six regions, but Bahrain was selected for the conference and it was under the patronage of uh, the late Prince Khalifa bin Salman Al Khalifa, the Prime Minister. Okay. The emblem, I thought this emblem of the first conference is very important. Uh, we, we had all many of our nurses who worked in the organizing committee, social committee, scientific committee, media. We worked uh, hard for one year preparing for this conference. And the chair of the organizing committee was Dr. Naima Al Qasir. The emblem says on the Delmonian boat that represents the history of Bahrain, 
is the Bahraini individual who is seeking knowledge through voyage into the future and opening new horizons to the world. The two global hemispheres coming together represent the global network. While the profile of the face represents the people of the world. The eye represents the continuous caring observant eye of the nurse. The, here are some pictures from that uh, conference. You see the banner. You, I am sure you know some of the nurses in the registration desk. Uh, on the right side are the volunteers, nursing students and and uh, all the uh, volunteers from the services. Here we have some more pictures, His Excellency the Minister of Health with the Chief Scientist for Nursing visiting the exhibition and you see the plenary session and some of the delegates including uh, late Ms. Umayya Atajar in the opening uh, ceremony. His Excellency Dr. Faisal Al Musawi and his welcoming message to the conference said, this international conference constitutes a landmark in the ongoing development of nursing and midwifery, and Bahrain is proud that the first conference of the network for the WHO collaborating center is held on our small but dynamic and progressive nation. Here are some more pictures of some of the delegates and the participants in the conference. Some more pictures. What we did also, we developed the proceeding of the conference when I was talking about documentation. And this is the task force that worked on the proceedings of the conference. Mr. Abdurrahman Bouali, then the Undersecretary for, for Health, in the closing ceremony said, we are privileged that over 180 participants from outside Bahrain had attended the conference. They came from 35 countries representing the six regional offices of WHO. Such a large gathering reflected the importance of the meeting and the high expectations of its activities. Also, when Dr. Naim Al Qasir, we have to remember this, was the chief nurse scientist in WHO headquarters in Geneva. During her tenure, the first global nursing strategy was developed in 2002. And from then on, every two or three years, a new strategic direction is developed. Working with ICN, what we have done, we empowered the nurses in the region, especially the GCC, to establish their professional organizations. We had members of our nursing society visiting Yemen, the UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, to help them how to develop the, their nursing organizations. Also, the Bahrain nurses from Bahrain worked very hard and participated actively in the organizing and preparing for the ICN regional and international conferences. Another important thing that we did, you know that Dr. Uh, Fatima Rafai, who is from the UAE, she is a board member of the ICN board of directors. And we are very proud and it's the first time that our region or the second time that our region is represented on the board of ICN and the first time the, the GCC national is represented. We worked a lot together on advoc to advocate for having our nursing leaders in the governing bodies of the ICN. In conclusion, next slide please or before my conclusion. OK, what was the professional satisfaction in working with nurses? Working with nurses and midwives in the different countries of the region 
to develop and strengthen nursing and midwifery to contribute towards achieving health for all the people. It was very satisfying to work with all the nurses, especially working with countries that are in conflict, war-torn countries, helping them to establish their educational institutions, their services to be able to serve their people. And last but not least, seeing young nurses and midwives graduating from these schools. Last slide, please. In conclusion, what are the messages, the key messages? Important key message for us to be able to move and lead is working together at all levels. Education, services, private, public, different sectors and sharing experiences. The second key message is having one voice and a shared vision. And focusing on lifelong learning and professional development. When we retire, it does not mean that our professional life has finished. That's the time where we can give more. Utilizing results of research and studies in developing nursing policy in all sectors and improving healthcare and nursing and midwifery care and services. And last, documenting our success stories. If we want to be part of the history, we need to document. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Fariba, for your uh, presentation. And I think it's clear that Bahrain is uh, uh, was taking, is still taking the lead in the uh, uh, initiatives that you know aim to develop nursing uh, in this part of the world. Uh, I'll just go through the um, questions and see uh, if there are two questions actually from the audience. And I think you have uh, answer, an answer to these questions. And the um, the attendee is asking about the uh, role of GCC nursing technical committee and uh, who were the uh, representatives from Bahrain in this uh, uh, committee. Would you like to uh, add anything regarding the role of the technical uh, GCC committee, other than that you have mentioned right now. You want me to answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I believe you you yeah. answered it in your presentation, but yeah, I, you I answered it. I don't know what is the status of the committee right now because of some of the situation in the GCC countries. The committee did not was not meeting maybe uh, regularly. And then we had the COVID-19, but hopefully uh, I think uh, the nursing leadership in the different GCC countries, both the people working in the ministries of health and in education, they should see who is the uh, re Bahrain representative in the executive board and communicate with them. I think Dr. Maryam al Hajri. She is rep the representative of Bahrain and the executive board where they, uh, you know, discuss the committee meetings. So we need, uh, you know, our nursing leadership to, to, to ask what's happening, what's going on, when will be the next uh, meeting? Because we used to have every two years uh, a conference where many of us uh, participated and uh, networked and shared experiences. Thank you. Dr. And, and the, the membership changes of the GCC country mm -hmm. uh, from for each country will decide like every four years or three years, different members will be present. And are there any uh, representative for nursing in the technical committee? The GCC technical committee is all nursing. Okay. The GCC nursing technical committee is all nurses. From each country, there are 12 members. I mean, in total, one from education, one from services.
from each country, each of okay. the six countries. Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, there is one more question. It's not clear to me, but I guess the audience is asking about uh, what's the best way for nurses to be part of the WHO uh, different initiatives? Maybe the audience is asking about future opportunities uh, for involvement in any work that, you know, uh, established by the WHO, I believe, if I'm right. OK, I think now we are fortunate. We have a WHO country office in Bahrain and Dr. Tasneem Al Atatra is the WHO representative uh, in, in Bahrain. And I think uh, we can, you know, whoever is interested, they can make an appointment and have discussions with her. Also, we have to see from the Ministry of Health uh, who, who is representing, you know, nursing in, in WHO and also to, to, to look at the website and see what are the initiatives. If it is the audience, whoever is asking is a full time job, then they should go and look at the vacancy notices in the WHO website. Yeah, I think we have five more minutes before we, we move to the second speaker, Professor John. I have a question here, but I can see other questions in the uh, question. Uh, Box and I think uh, they are asking, what's your advice to future nurses uh, from Bahrain to be part of the ICN and international uh, collaboration? Yeah, we are already part of ICN because we have a, our nursing society and our nursing society's membership in ICN. You know, is, is a member. We our membership. Uh, was suspended for a few years, uh, but uh, we are back now on track. I think we need to get uh, involved to see what's happening, you know, in the ICN or uh, WHO to be active in our uh, professional uh, organization and, and also network. Now, all the GCC countries, all of them now, they have nursing organizations. I mean, professional nursing associations. So you are saying that, yeah, sorry. In, in the 80s, we had only, I mean, early 90s, it was only Kuwait and Bahrain. This year, we have the six countries and they have very strong uh, associations. I think we need, what is important, my message is that we need to communicate with all the nurses you know, from the nursing, it is not only, I mean, when we are in the boards of different organizations, professional organizations, it's very important that we make sure, make sure that our membership and our nurses at large know what's happening in nursing in ICN and, and get the feedback from the grassroots. We need to filter the information and make sure, share, share information. What, what hurts me, you know, now, if you ask for any document or any paper, there are so much restrictions that information is not shared like uh, 20 or 30 years ago or documents, even though we have explosion of information and we have various ways to get it. But sharing of experiences is very important and mentoring, mentoring and empowering the young nurses and midwives. Yeah. Yani yeah. This message, maybe I did not put it in my conclusion, but mentoring is very important to have a shadow, you know, somebody working with us, a young nurse, yeah, working absolutely. with her or him on different initiatives. It shouldn't be only we, the older nurses. We need to bring on board the young ones. Even if they don't know, they will learn and we will gain from their experiences as well. And I think that's really important, uh, you know, talking about, you know, uh, preparing the future uh, leaders. So what I understood from your response, 
that the gate to international organization like ICN to join the local uh, society which uh, will feed uh, on what's really going on at international level. I have a question for you, um, Dr. Friba, if you allow me, and this is the last question. Uh, uh, you talk about um, the strategies that uh, the technical you know, committee developed during the first seminar in Abu Dhabi 1993, and that strategy was submitted maybe to the key, uh, uh, key policy makers and their secretaries or a minister. What challenges you encounter as a nurse working with a policy maker? And what's your advice for nurses to be more visible, maybe I'm, uh, I'm posting two questions here. The challenges you encounter in working with a policy maker at a country level, and how did you find your way to work with uh, the policy maker? And what's your uh, advice to make nurses more visible and be around the table that take a decision to inform uh, the health reform. Okay. About the strategy, of course, this was the first strategy, but after that, every four years, there was a new strategy. And when the nursing representatives attended the GCC technical committee, each country had to report what they have done, where they have reached. So there was like a competition between the countries. Oh, we have stopped the uh, AD level entry into nursing. We started, we take now nurses only from uh, entry level is at the BS or we did this. So there was, this was a kind of a monitoring. I think uh, the role for nurses to be visible, we have to learn to work with the media. Unfortunately, as nurses, we don't know how to work with the media. The media doesn't know what is our role. When we were visible, we worked closely on a weekly basis, whatever activity we had. We would call the, uh, you know, the journalists, discuss, sometimes have a, a whole, uh, like a, a seminar uh, or a workshop and talk about nursing and what its role. And this is how we became visible. And I think with the policymakers, we have to learn how to listen and also how to negotiate and use evidence, evidence, statistics, you know, information to bring at the table why we are pushing for this policy because of one, two, three and working together when i said one voice what i meant if i went as a, a head of the nursing department and saw the minister and then somebody from the services or went or uh, Le uh, mrs Leila as a registrar went to the minister uh, we went separately to discuss an issue but we had the same message not conflicting messages. The, the thing that I heard, many ministers said, oh, you nurses, you don't know how to work together. One voice, one message. What, how to reach that? We need to sit together, share, and, and do joint work and explain so that all of us have the same message. Thank you, and I think this is a conclusive message for the importance of uh, sharing shared vision and working uh, together. I would like to uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Fariba, and now we have to move to the uh, next speaker, Professor um, John um, Flood. So John Flood is a professor of uh, medicine and head of medicine department at RCSI uh, Bahrain. Uh, he is also the director of Senior uh, Cycle 2 Studies in the School of uh, Medicine. His uh, research of interest is uh, on cardiovascular diseases and endocrine um, tumors. Uh, Professor John is also interested in radioactive isotopes 
and diet and ancient population and paleopathology. Uh, he is also interested in collaborative research with basic uh, science uh, colleagues at RCSI Bahrain and the University of uh, Manchester. Uh, and uh, this is all what I have about Professor John. And if you'd like to add anything, Professor John, about your no, role, <laughs> you, you are more no, than I uh, no, welcome. I think, that's more, I think that's more than enough. That's more than enough. Yeah, uh, thank you, you Hussein. So, uh, so, okay, thank you. So, welcome everybody. Uh, the initiative um, behind the History of Medicine series uh, has to be awarded to Professor Martin Corbley. Um, and uh, he and I had uh, many discussions uh, socially and otherwise about the importance of the history of medicine. And he's been the impetus behind the development of this, which is now into its second year. <clears throat> also next year, um, in, the year in the early years of the curriculum, there will be subjects introduced in the area of medical humanities, which I will be teaching. And hopefully I'll have plenty of students in the area of medical history and the area of social history in relation to medicine between the 15th and 20th century. So I'll get hopefully get collaboration with my colleagues in the Department of Medicine Survey to deliver those lectures, of which they are uh, 10 to each session or nine or 10 in an exam. So it will be a formal part of the curriculum for medical students uh, next year. I hope we will expand it more. Now my talk today, uh, so just before I go into my talk today, I'd like to just highlight the uh, other members of the medical faculty. Uh, Gabriel uh, Fox will be doing a talk on cholera. Uh, Nadji will be talking on uh, the history of the of discovery of insulin, which has now become very controversial because one of the discoverers best is trying to rewrite history and we'll have a great discussion around that. Martin Corbley, who has great experience in surgery in Africa is going to talk about African medicine and I myself are going to talk about the, the plague of 1348 and other plagues in early February. But today the, the story is about uh, Egypt, it's about Africa, Africa in ancient times. Uh, it's, it's more than the, just that because I thought when I initially developed the lecture and put it together, uh, which is about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, that if I actually went on about Egyptian medicine for 45 minutes you would all leave and and, and never come back again to medical history. It turned out to be a little bit bland. So I divided the lecture into three parts. The first part will be Egyptian medicine and we look at the wonderful development and complexity and uh, how advanced they were 3000 years ago in Egypt. Uh, it, in, it, then I am going to move on to a disease which I will be giving a lecture on in the rest of Manchester on Friday by webinar as well on the paleopathology of tuberculosis, a disease that plagued the ancient world just like it does today. And and then finally, uh, I, if we have time, we may not have, uh, I have a lot of slides. Um, most of them are pictorial rather than text, so it makes it easier to digest if you get a representation rather than lots of information. Uh, the third part of the talk will be then be about a, 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 a very famous Irishman who should have been awarded the Nobel Prize for medicine, but wasn't. Um, and um, uh, he has made he has in, he has made huge advances or made huge advances in the epidemiology of cancer and colon cancer, uh, hematological cancer in the form of Burkitt's lymphoma, and of course his work wonderful work with the MRC in England on uh, higher of fish diet and colon cancer. Very modest man in his life uh, should have been awarded the Nobel Prize, and I'm absolutely convinced of that. His contribution to the understanding of hematological hematological meningitis was enormous. So the first slide, please, uh, will be, we're going to start now by looking at Egyptian medicine. So this part of the world, which is not geographically that far from us here, is rich in culture. It's rich going back thousands of years. Even to this day, uh, it is a rich part of the world as regards cultural diversity. Let's take uh, just briefly an area or a country in conflict at the moment with the Tigray uh, uh, conflict, the, the Tigray uh, part of the country causing trouble which is Ethiopia, um, south of the picture we see today. Ethiopia has got 80 ethnic groups, many different languages like Amharic, Oromo, Afar, Somali and so on. Um, wonderfully rich country. Uh, in this picture here we see Egypt in ancient times. Below it we see Nubia, the, the kingdom of, of Kush. Uh, and we will discuss uh, the, the interaction between these two kingdoms with the next slide. So what do you see here? You see why the uh, Egypt evolved, why it originated here. This is a country like um, the Mesopotamian civilization around the Tigris and Euphrates River, 
this is a country built around a river. You see this all over the world historically. In Ireland, you see it, all the monasteries built beside rivers. So this is not an unexpected ev evolution of a culture of a civilization evolving around a very, very large river, which brought nutrients down from uh, the lakes and um, the mountains of the moon, as they're described in the old uh, atlases of Africa, down onto the delta into the Mediterranean. It's a massive big alluvial uh, plain full of nutrients and, and uh, absolutely uh, you know, perfect place to have agriculture. It was a vast kingdom Egypt was. It had enormous ties from other countries across the Levant into North Africa. It had enormous influences culturally across North Africa and the Levant and did so for over 3000 years, roughly 3000 years up to the conquest by the Macedonians or the Greeks in 332 BC. It was dependent on the Nile for uh, its uh, for its tri to thrive as a culture, as a civilization. Its main uh, population depended on agriculture. They were farmers. Only one percent of the Egyptian population were actually educated. The country was run, uh, unlike India now, which has got a massive bureaucracy and um, Bahrain to some extent as well. Country, uh, you know, steeped in bureaucracy. Egypt was run on about 5,000 people running the country and it consisted of uh, scribes mainly uh, and the scribes uh, were involved in writing and writing was done on papyri and writing and communication like that was the hot, was the, the lifeblood of Egyptian culture. The, the country sustained its um, survival based on good government and good communication. There were a number of times where, of course, government failed, which we call the intermediate periods. But by and large, for 3000 years, it was highly successful as a country um, uh, which extended from the delta, which is in the north, right down as far as Aswan, which is the first cataract. So the first cataract is probably the, 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 the ge geographical delineation from, from, the, from Nubia, which is to the south. Now, what are the important? Uh, so the bottom part of the picture shows you upper Upper Egypt and the Lower Egypt is up towards the Delta. Modern day Cairo, as you see, is near Giza, near the pyramids. This is where the civilization started. And then with time, uh, it moved down south towards Abydos and the Valley of the Kings, as you'll see further down. And then to Thebes. We'll be talking about Abydos later. Uh, we'll be talking about some uh, case history of um, some specimens from Abydos and from Thebes West uh, to look at how TB was identified in their, in the, in their remains. Um, the, uh, the Nile itself, as you can see, the alluvial plain is quite wide as you move up, but as you go down south towards Nubia, it gets very narrow and the alluvial plain is, is very narrow because the sides of the Niles to the south are very steep, but up towards the north are much shallower and there's a large dissipation of the uh, the silt into the uh, alluvial plain to produce very rich nitrogen, phosphate, phosphorus, and so on, and phosphate, I should say, and nitrogen into the into the the ground to uh, for, so that agriculture could thrive. So this is a bit a busy slide, but I just want to show you that um, this, when you talk about Egypt, you can't talk about Egypt on its own. You can't talk about this wonderful culture and civilization because, of course, just below it you have. Uh, the kingdom of Kush and, and Nubia. And this was a just a, not quite as complex a culture or, or as a civilization as they won, as the Egypt to the north, but uh, they have they had their own language. They had um, uh, they had a kingdom or a centered around Kerma. They had uh, they had their own uh, uh, sarcophagi, their own uh, pyramids and so on and so forth, which are now being excavated. Uh, but a lot of them, of course, damaged by sand and, and wind erosion uh, and are not as well described as they are in the towards the north. At one stage in the, in the, um, the 25th dynasty, the Kushites actually conquered all of Egypt and became pharaohs. They were eventually displaced by the Assyrians. And then, of course, the Greeks came along and so on and so forth. So the, the Egyptians did recognize them though as a unique people. In the depictions of the Nubians in hieroglyphics, they are actually d depicted as having a distinct hairdo and dress and so on and so forth. But there was a lot of um, interaction between the two kingdoms and there, the kingdom of um, Kush is actually ignored quite a lot because of course of such a dominance by Egypt to its north. But nevertheless, um, uh, there was a rich interaction both economically and culturally between the two. And at one stage, eventually, of course, the Egyptians conquered uh, Nubia and later in towards the New Kingdom. 
so how was it organized? Well, actually, it was organized in into little gnomes. That was the uh, like what would you describe as a province, and there were um, uh, thirty five gnomes, and they had administrative staff in all the gnomes, and they had basically scribes. So when the administrative staff in the gnomes, administrative staff staff in the gnomes wanted to communicate with the pharaoh and his and his court, it was done by writing. Hence the flourishing of writing and on 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 papyri and scribes in this culture. There were 30 dynasties. And this is how uh, Egyptian history is divided up. Uh, this is what's done in retrospect. Of course, the Egyptians weren't aware of this type of, uh, d you know, d divisions of uh, time. Um, but uh, it was all put together by a, uh, a Greek or Roman writer in uh, three, third century before Christ called Meneto of Sabaitos. And what he did was he wrote a treatise called Egyptica and he went back to uh, many papyri, the Turin papyrus is probably the only remaining one, and delineated all these the time sequences uh, to give a, a picture of of, um, of Egyptian history. Now I, I won't go into it in fine detail, but I will just point out some uh, important bits to understand the subsequent slides. So if you go back to 3,500 on the left, this is what we call pre-dynastic. This is before the the idea of the pharaoh came along. Burials were in sh in shallow pits in a flexed position, uh, there were no grave goods put in and there was no hieroglyphics or, or basically decorations of our Egyptian art. Then we come along to 2500, that's the old kingdom, when most of the pyramids were built. So the pyramids were not built right through the whole uh, period of Egyptian history. Most of it was done uh, starting off with the step, step pyramid in Saqqara built by Geoser. And from there on then we have um, old, middle and, uh, um, and new kingdom. And then we have intermediate periods between the three, as you can see, first intermediate period and, and uh, second and third. And these were times of great political turmoil where you had Persians and other nations coming in and inv invading the country and, and basically taking over when internal conflict allowed them to do so. There was a resurgence of Egyptian authority again. And of course, we have a progression then into new and late kingdoms. But in 330 BC, uh, the game was up. Um, uh, 322 is depicted here, but it was a bit earlier than this. And the Greek Roma period started with the in invasion by Alexander the Great. As you know, he invaded most of the world right across to I India and set up four of his generals in um, uh, powers of in places of power. Um, the main one we're interested in today, of course, is Ptolemy. So Ptolemy the first Sota was one of uh, Alexander's generals and he started the Ptolemaic period, which goes on to um, Ptolemy uh, the 13th, who is of course killed by uh, Augustus or Octavian. And the Cleopatra the seventh was the last Cleopatra, her his, his, uh, Cle uh, Cle uh, Tommy the 13th sister. And uh, of course she had a child called Caesar on with Caesar and subsequently committed suicide and, and then Octavian commit, com com killed the leer last year to the throne and it became a Roman province. It became a very important Roman province, the only one under the control of, of the emperor because it was the breadbasket of the Roman Empire. It was such a rich place uh, when it comes to production of agricultural products. So what did they produce? Well, they produced, you know, emmet wheat, barley. They had cattle domesticated, they had sheep, ducks. The, these pharaohs used to go into the desert and, uh, and hunt antelope and ibex. The organization was around villages built of mud huts. How many people lived there? Well, in the early period, which we call the early dynastic period, probably about one and a half million. And as we go down towards the Greek or Roman period, probably three million. So it was a vast population. And they were productive. They were great builders. This, the, the, the real great technical achievement of the Egyptians was, was basically stone buildings uh, in the form of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, the pyramids. And beside these stone pyramids were uh, villages. These villages were populated by workers. The most famous, of course, is Dyer Medina, which is now being excavated. And of course, you had doctors there and you had medical tools and you had records left of medical activity, which we'll look at a bit later. What was the name? How did the name of the pharaoh come along? I believe that the Egyptians didn't call him the pharaoh. He was the king and he was a manifestation of God, their gods on earth. And they had a very complex religious polytheistic religious system. Uh, they had, uh, I, I, and a lot of Western Christianity comes from the, the rebirth of ISIS and all of this is all Christianity. A lot of Christ, Christian motifs or mythologies come from actually Egyptian, Egyptian uh, writing and scribes is a vital part of their culture. 
and the, 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 they are depicted. The, we are very blessed today by having such uh, good records, not, not an abundance of them, but we have are quite good in quality uh, of medical activity of them. Um, they have wrote uh, uh, stuff on mathematics, on astronomy, on medicine, on, on, on architecture and so on and how to build things. Um, a lot of course has been lost and destroyed, but we still have some evidence dissipated across museums across the world. So uh, how did uh, how was writing and, and, and communication used? What was it used as a tool of centralization of the Egyptian state and self-preservation? And it's a cuneiform type of writing. So how do we know doctors even existed? Well, they had they had names. The, in in a demotic, the doctor was or, or was was called um, S W in uh, S W N W or or uh, Semwin. That's in demotic and in hieroglyphics, he's depicted as a man with a pot and a lancer, a lancet or a, or a scalpel. So we have hieroglyphic evidence that doctors existed. We have also got written evidence. Have we got evidence that women existed in medicine? Yes, we have. There are two cases, uh, Perishwet in the uh, Old Kingdom, 2,300 2, years BC, he was an overseer of female doctors, and Tanwe during the Roman times was a female doctor. Uh, have we specialization? Yes, we have. In the fourth century BC, Herodotus, a very famous historian, visited Egypt and commented on how doctors had different roles in Egyptian medicine. We had ophthalmologists, we had orthopedic doctors, we had uh, keepers of the anus, which was one of the roles a doctor had with the pharaoh. Um, we had uh, doctors of skin and so on and so forth. So they specialized. Um, and and uh, their knowledge was incredible. They didn't do surgery as much as the Romans did, uh, and they very much relied on herbs, uh, tried and tested uh, herbal medicines to cure and treat illnesses. They even had um, uh, forms of contraception, which we'll talk about in a minute, which we, when we look at the Ebers papyrus. Now, the first doctor is described as this man. He's the, the god, the demigod of medicine, Imhotep. He comes from the old kingdom, 3,000, 2,650 BC. So he's looking, he's four, five, maybe 5,000 years ago. He was the architect of the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara built by the Joshua, and he was also his chief minister. He wrote uh, a lot of treatises on on um, uh, on medicine, on surgery, on mainly surgery, and is thought that his writings in 2,600 were translated into the uh, 1600 BC when the Edmund Smith Papyrus was written. So the Edmund Smith Papyrus is not original. It actually is a compilation of writings that come down from this very famous man, Imhotep. And he's depicted, as you can see here, with a scroll in his hand, and is considered to be the founder of medicine in Egypt and the area's known physician. So what evidence have we got otherwise, other than hieroglyphics and and written evidence that doctors existed in, in, in Egypt. Well, we have the papyri, and there are a large number of them. Some of them are in very good shape, some of them are in very poor shape. Each one of them have different roles or different emphasis. So the Edwin Smith one is the surgical one, the Ebers one is full of magic, and it, it looks at, uh, you know, uh, magical cures, uh, herbal cures, and so on. The Kayon one is gynecology, and there are many more. There's the, 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 there's, there's the Kalsberg one in Denmark, there's the London Papyrus, there's the Chester Beatty one, and so on and so forth. And they all uh, tend to emphasize specific areas of medical practice. Now, we're just going to, we only have time today to look at two, uh, and we look at the Edwin Smith one first, uh, which is uh, this one we see on the right. Now, the Edwin Smith, in very brief terms, was obviously was bought by Edwin Smith in 1862. Uh, from a trader in, 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 in Thebes. He just found a guy in the street selling stuff and he went and bought it off him, not realizing, realizing its importance. He then, it, it, it's a very, a very large uh, piece of papyrus. It's 15 feet uh, long and it's got on its recto side um, 377 lines, 17 columns, and on the opposite side, the verso, 60, 92 lines and five columns. What does it describe? Well, it describes surgical practice. It starts at the head and gives you um, uh, 48 cases of injury. Now, of course, injuries would be are very common, would have been very common in Egyptian culture because or Egypt society, because they were building everywhere. And lots of people would have dropped stones on their foot, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. And it would have been hit across the head with pebble, with large stones rolling off the pyramids that were half built. So you, 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 you find in the Edward Smith papyrus exactly what you would expect, uh, head injuries and bony injuries to forearm, legs, 
long long limbs, and particularly to the head and nose. So um, how is it organized? Well, it's organized, as you can see here, to be read like right to left. And um, and this is hieratic writing. Um, and how do they describe the, the cases? Well, they're divided into, they give you the problem, they give you the diagnosis, and then they give you a, a management plan. The management plan is divided in, I will treat it, I will contend it, and I will not treat. So how good were they? Well, they didn't realize or weren't aware of the idea of a bug of an infection, but they were so aware that if you got a head injury, and I'll read out a description of a head injury to you, um, from the Edward Smith uh, uh, papyrus, and it goes as follows. If you examine a man having a gaping wound in his head, reaching the bone, smashing his skull and breaking open his brain, you should feel his wound. You find the smash, which is in his skull, like the corrugation, which appears on molten copper. In other words, he's feeling dura. And sometimes therein throbs and flushes under your fingers like the weak place in the head of a child where it has not become whole. So he's describing the pulsation of the heart as you would feel in, a, in the, an opened anterior fontanelle in a child. Now they were, uh, they were educated enough that if the patient or the, their patient with this head injury had a stiff neck, that this was uncurable. They didn't call it meningitis, but they were well aware that combination of, of uh, symptoms and signs was uh, un unretrievable and they would not treat that. And that's exactly how they described it. Now, the other, other interesting thing uh, that, uh, that they describe in, in the Ebers, which is, uh, just hasn't changed a bit in through what, five, what, 3,000 years, 2,000 years? Instruction for the treatment of a broken nose. Number one, examine. If you examine a man whose nose is disfigured, nose is disfigured, part of it being squashed in, while the other part is swollen and both nostrils are bleeding. That's the examination. Diagnosis. Then you should say you have a broken nose and I can treat this ailment. Treatment. You should clean his nose with two plugs of linen and then insert two plugs soaked in grease into his nose. You should make him rest until the swelling has gone down, bandage his nose with, nose with stiff rolls of linen and treat him with lint every day until he recovers. I don't think the treatment of uh, fractured nasal bones has changed in that period of time and they were uh, well aware of how to do it properly in their ancient times. They, this is the other um, papyrus which, uh, was, has, which has, got, uh, has been analysed uh, extensively. And uh, if any of you are, are interested, I'll just show up. Uh, is this either the student project or any otherwise? This is Bristed's book on, for example, the um, the Edward Smith papyrus. It's about 500 pages long. So it just shows you how much effort has gone into deciphering these papyri. Now the Ebers one is different. It's not as surgical or as logical or rational as the Edward Smith. Uh, again, it's uh, Middle Kingdom, 1550. Um, and it was found in Luxor, and what, what happened in Luxor was Smith actually uh, sold it to Ebers later, but Smith, again, a very enterprising man, was walking along the street and this poor farmer was trying to sell off stuff to buy his fertilizer for his, for his farm. And he handed uh, Edwin Smith uh, this papyrus, which uh, is written in hieratic, as you can see. And eventually it went to Ebers and he didn't, uh, I don't know how it managed to get translated, but it's now in Leipzig, the University of Medic in the library in Leipzig. It's got 700 magical formulas in it and it's got a treatment for asthma, which is very rational again. They, they describe how you put herbs on a hot stone and create a, uh, a mist and the patient then in, 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 inhales the mist, just like we used, uh, just like you would use, for example, uh, Vic and, and hot water for people who've got a bit of um, bronchi bronchospasm or a hot respiratory tract infection. For contraception in this, they again, very rational. They would advise the woman to get dates and acacia and honey and make it into a plug of wool as a pursuer. And of course, as you know, honey is hyperosmolar and would kill off the sperm. And this was a form of contraception that they had in, uh, in, in, um, in ancient times from this papyrus. Again, showing you how advanced these uh, medical practitioners were uh, in, in, in Egypt. Then, then you could progress on from these, this Middle Kingdom period onto uh, stepwise right through, but it get, would get boring. It would be highly, uh, it would just be highly repetitious. So I decided to jump to Greco-Roman times, 300 BC. Again, just to make the point to you that breast cancer was first identified in ancient scripts in the Edward Smith papyrus, where they actually would cauterize the breast lump 
and use herbs to treat it with poultices. Again, you're looking at 4,000 years ago. Just one thing that's interesting about this one on the Edward Smith papyrus, they used red meat over um, areas that were traumatized and bleeding. And of course, red meat is, uh, was a very effective way. It's like a, 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 a lattice for trombin to bind to, to prevent the bleeding. They use honey as well. And honey has been used as a form of antiseptic for thousands of years. The medieval monks used to use it. And even in Africa today, when people can't afford antibiotics, they use honey apotus. And it's because it's hyperosmolar and kills the bacteria and also stimulates white cells. And also, believe it or not, they use moldy bread for, from which the Pilicin mold is, as a, uh, was a practice in Europe up to the Renaissance. And the, the Egyptians even used that as a form of, of a treating infection. So they were very advanced. They mightn't have known the tissue mechanisms of uh, these uh, forms of treatment, but they still, by trial and error, were very effective at uh, treating their patients. So these are examples of, uh, this is Comumbre, uh, it's a, it's a um, uh, temple halfway down the Nile, and these are surgical instruments uh, depicted on it. Uh, it's on the outside lateral wall. There's a lot of controversy about this particular Comumbre depiction of surgical instruments. Some people say they're actually technical instruments for building, but um, I found this slide showing you what they probably represent surgically. And you can see they're full of mallets and hammers and weighing scale to weigh, um, medicines and forceps and so on. Again, uh, surgical instruments from the Egyptian medical practice are rare. They are rare. I'm afraid most of them are either not been found or destroyed from the older Middle Kingdom and even from the New Kingdom. Most of the instruments that um, have survived have come from the Greek Roman period, which is 300 BC. Um, if you, any of you are interested in this part of medicine, uh, there are some in the in British Museum, but the best collection uh, of Roman uh, instruments is in the Archeolo Museum Archaeological in Naples, where I did some research many years ago, looking at surgical instruments excavated from Pompeii and Herculaneum. And they have a huge collection, massive collection, all over the place, badly organized, with very little uh, providence, providence meaning uh, where they came from. So they were just thrown into a box and brought over, and nobody is quite sure which houses they came from. And that was my thesis trying to find out that uh, where the surgical instruments came from. But this is an example of Egyptian surgical instruments. There's a lance there and there's a separator and there is a uh, hook and there is a copping uh, vessel at the top. So what did what, uh, they used herbs and used they used herbs for treating medical problems. They used a whole of concoctions of different uh, compounds, but this is the best one. And this is a patient being treated with beer. Uh, uh, as a form of medication for a sick patient. And I would highly recommend this as a form of treatment for any illness. They were quite good at dental procedures. This is a dental, uh, this is basically a dental prosthesis put in by an Egyptian doctor dentist of middle teeth wired in with gold wires. Uh, and, and, and this is basically lower mandible, as you can see, you can see the, the foramen at the bottom. And this is circumcision. This comes from, um, I can see that comes from uh, the tomb of a of a of a high priest, uh, and it shows circumcision occurring. And I think this is 2,500 years. So circumcision did a cap, but was actually performed in Egypt, uh, going back to uh, 2,000 years before Christ. And you can see his hand has been held. So I could keep going, give you more evidence of medical practice, but it would be highly repetitive. So I've done a big skip down to Greek Roman times, and in Greek Roman times. We have a school of medicine in Alexandria. We have a library founded by Ptolemy the first Sotar, who was the founder of the, the great library of Alexandria, which is now being resurrected from the ashes in Alexandria. There's a massive, beautiful library in Alexandria now. But unfortunately, all the old manuscripts have been destroyed and burnt and lost through time. In this medical school, there was a, uh, Pratagoras was a great teacher and he taught two people, Eros, Erastostratus of Chios and Herophilus of Chalcedon. And these are the, probably the first great anatomists of the ancient world. OK, so again, just brief uh, exposure to what these men discovered. Um, the, uh, I won't go into fine detail, but uh, Erastostratus um, basically uh, worked not only in Cairo, in Alexandria, but elsewhere as well for other very famous and very powerful men. But his contribution to medicine uh, is amazing. He actually was able to differentiate veins from arteries. He was able to identify the valves of the heart. He didn't work out the circulation as such. Uh, he identified dura mater. And one of his most amazing experiments was 
that he our uh, uh, writings was on the what actually happened to veins and arteries. So he said the blood is in the veins and in the arteries is Newman, what they call air, what we call now know as oxygen. But he wasn't sure how it actually traveled. So he did an experiment once, which is which is in the literature of getting the a cock, a cock uh, or a hen, and he opened the femoral artery of the hen underwater to see that it did bubble. And this was the type of discussion that was going on, you know, 300 years BC at the medical school in Alexandria. And I think this is wonderful to believe that this is the topic of discussion amongst these great men in ancient times. Herophilus is different. Herophilus um, was uh, basically the, the great dissector. The worry is about Herophilus is that it's thought that he was given live uh, criminals by um, by Ptolemy and that he basically dissected live, live, live uh, human beings who are still uh, awake and not actually murdered or are executed. Nobody's quite sure how valid that description or accusation is, but there is a worry from the literature that that's what happened. He does, his contribution to medicine basically is to neuro, neuroscience. He described the ventricles of the brain and he also described the confluence of the, of the venous sinuses, which and we still describe it today as the as the torcular of Herophilus, the back of this occipital bone on the inside where the veins, the venous sinuses all converge. That's called after Herophilus. So uh, uh, these are the contributions that he made. As I said, to, the, I described the word Newman, uh, arteries carrying Newman, uh, obtained air through the lungs and veins, bringing food or blood to the tissues. And this is what he's contributed to. So that's the history of medicine in a very short abbreviated form. It would be uh, highly repetitive if I went through each particular phase and other characters and other pieces of evidence. Most of the rest of the evidence would be an analysis of of the um, of the papyri and I think really it would just get highly repetitive. So I thought now that you've all got a background and since a lot of our, I hope a lot of our attendees of which you've got eight or 20 are nurses, I thought well, this is a good, a good reason or a great opportunity for me to explain the pathophysiology of tuberculosis to the nursing students, as well as look at its evidence of the dis disease from ancient times. And that's the next part of the lecture. And we'll stop after the, that. We won't want it in this bucket, which I'll do another time. So uh, TB, it's an ancient disease, uh, goes back and has been described by Hippocrates and Galen in the third century AD in the Western classical world in ancient Egypt and in the Far East. It is a major, it is a major global health problem even today. In 2012, 8.8 million people in the world developed tuberculosis, of which 1.8 million died. Now, this is only eight, nine years ago. Nearly 2 million people died from tuberculosis, even though we've got a myriad of treatments in the pharma pharmacotherapy to treat it. People are still dying from it in millions. 300,000 or 400,000 of these have co-infection with HIV. Most of these, of course, are in sub-Saharan Africa and with poor medical facilities and so on. Even more worrying, a third of the world's population have got latent tuberculosis, sitting there to explode into the full-blown disease. And the, uh, uh, the um, uh, potential medical emergency that it might occur, uh, you know, with obesity and diabetes developing over the next hundred years is going to be catastrophic because the things that are create the transfer latent tuberculosis into active TB are things like malnutrition, uh, immunosuppression, and of course, obesity and type 2 diabetes. So as we get a fatter population in the Middle East, in America, uh, particularly here in Africa, as people in Africa get more nourished and get diabetes, then latent TB is going to reactivate and this pandemic of two million people of two million people here dying will be in nothing to what's going to happen in the next 50 years. What causes TB? Well, it's a, it's a collection of many bacteria uh, belong to a group which we'll describe from here on as the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. They are ob obligate parasites and they've got a very, very, very rigid uh, cell wall which is full of fat. Um, uh, it's mostly, basically um, gram-positive organisms, gram-negative, have got 5 and 10% fat in their wall, but mycobacterium has got 40, so it's like a cake with a cream on it, and this makes it very resilient in fighting um, macrophages and, and T cells to kill it. And this is why it can persist in your body for years as latent tuberculosis. We're looking at auramine here. This is the dye that Koch came up with in Berlin, 
and it stains uh, mycobacterium. It's called acid fast because you can't wash it off with acid as you can with other bacteria. So it sits in this slide like this and it sticks, the RNA sticks to the mycolic acid in the covalent bond, so you just can't wash it off, hence the term acid fast bacilli. This is what a granuloma looks like in in uh, in a uh, comic form or in yeah in, in a pictorial form. And you got T cells around, which you got Casey's granuloma in the middle, broke breakdown of tissues full of fatty acids and dead bacteria as well. So this is a contained infection of TB. And this shows a macrophage, an electron microscope macrophage engulfing mycobacterium. Wonderful slide, I thought. This is uh, tuberculosis. This is cavitating TB, which is secondary TB. So there are three types of tuberculosis, primary, secondary, and latent. Primary is when you get the gone focus, young kid inhales it, goes out to the pleura, uh, causes um, a reaction there. Then the ipsilateral nodes are, in, are enlarged, that's your gone complex. Then you get re-exposed many years later, and you have a hyperimmune response, which is called a, they call an animistic rise in the immunological reaction, and you get necrosis and cavitation, that's secondary TB, and it's in a very aerated part of the lung, which is the apex, and that's why secondary TB is, is found there. The consequences of um, uh, primary tuberculosis, which is basically mineral tuberculosis, and if it arose into the pleural cavity, it's the pleural effusion, and of course, um, TB meningitis in kids is another consequence, a devastating one if you get it. Now, what does it look like at gross pathology? Well, since most of the students, including nursing students, don't get any pathology uh, teaching or using gross anatomy, I thought I'd do my contribution to your education by showing you this. This is a sagittal section of a lung showing uh, the, the upper and middle lobe bronchus uh, and at the bottom your lower lobe bronchus, which is not as well ob as obvious, and then shows um, up on the at about uh, two o'clock on the day on the clock show a big area of caseation and cavitation, which is basically the necrosis you get with mycobacteria. This is osseous disease. So in, in a series from Kings and Denmark Hill, 8% of patients in a series of about 1800 patients had TB evolving bone, predominantly the mid thoracic vertebral bodies. This comes from an ancient specimen and it's just a good gross anatomy example of what TB looks like in bone. And you can see how you get vertebral body collapse, porosity and and erosion and newborn formation at the edge. This is the cell wall, as you can see, it's got mycolic acid and it's got um, glycoproteins and glycolipids and, get, and outside the cytoplasm, very, very, very resistant wall to uh, attacking by T cells. And the part I'm interested in is the mycolic acid at the outside. These are long chain fatty acids uh, up to C90, C85, C90. Um, there's three types which you look at in a minute, and this is what is unique to mycobacterium. So if you want to find out, to find mycobacterium in tissues or in bone, uh, you can you look for mycolic acid because you don't get it in mammalian tissue. And this is a good way of identifying TB in ancient specimen. Now our first case um, is a Granville mummy. We're going to look at two case histories, which I'll get through fairly quickly. This is the Granville mummy. So it was um, uh, owned by an obstetrician in London. And it's a woman called um, Irenishu from the 26th dynasty, 600 BC. And she was found in the necropolis in Thebes. She was owned by, uh, by Granville and he went along and dissected her and decided she had a right ovarian tumour and this was the cause of death. It was then carted off to the British Museum and put in boxes. And in 1994, um, people uh, did some swabs on it and decided that the patient that our, our particular mummy had died from falciparum malaria because the falciparum malaria immunological test was positive. But of course, as you know, one of the great mimickers of a positive falciparum test is rheumatoid factor positivity, which occurs in 5% of the population. So the test was incorrect. They completely ignored a plural exudate uh, and then um, a very eminent professor of biology in Birmingham called uh, David Minikin this it did an analysis of uh, this, the mummy looking for tuberculosis. And he, Helen Dunner, who wrote the paper, and it's published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society um, in 2009. So what they, did, did, what they did was they went along and they used high performance liquid chromatography. Now, since I'm running out of time, I don't have time to explain it in fine detail, but high performance liquid chromatography is a column and you have a pump and you pump yeah, uh, your exudate or your swab material in water or uh, it's genuine, it can be hexane or it can be water, you pump it through and the column has got either polar or non-polar and you can separate out long chain fatty acids uh, in according to their uh, charges and you can do this over time uh, and therefore uh, you can separate out these to give you peaks and these are the mycolic acids, there's the alpha, 
the methoxy, which is OCH3, and then the keto at the bottom. Next slide, please. And that's exactly what they did here. They had a blank at the bottom, then they have an NTB standard from a current tuberculosis patient, and they swabbed um, uh, the Granville mummy, both lungs and femur, and sure enough, the peaks of mycolic acid correspond exactly to tuberculosis. So this woman did not die from ovarian cancer. She did not die from uh, fat sparmary, she died from mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is the evidence in HPLC, but that's not enough. Next slide, please. This is the separation out of them again and it corresponds directly to mycobacterium. The, the line across the bottom is the eluid time uh, again and the vertical column is absorbance. So this woman had tuberculosis. They weren't happy with that. So what they did then was they took her DNA, they amplified with PCR, they, uh, uh, they then took a part out of it that's repeated uh, IS um, 6110 and they got a restriction in the nucleus and they chopped it and there is characteristics um, base pair fragment that comes out of this which is uh, 123 and 92 and this confirms by molecular biology techniques that this woman had tuberculosis and this is typical of MTB. The 11th column are the molecular weight markers so this is a 92 base pair um, fragment of mycobacterium DNA. So we have evidence here of TB both from HPLC and molecular biology completely contradicting the previously thought cause of death. Now, the last bit of my talk uh, is about a lovely paper done um, a number of years ago, looking at exactly the same uh, thing, except they looked at it in two, uh, two uh, necropolises, one in Thebes and one in Abydos. Abydos is very old, 3000 years, Thebes is a bit later. It's called the kingdom of the, the, called the tombs of the nobles, very rich area where a lot of the nobles were buried. And there were about 400 or 600 uh, uh, skeletons there, all uh, no flesh on them because they were destroyed and damaged by tomb raiders over the years. This is what they looked, the previous slide shows what they looked like macroscopically. So they ended up with 41 uh, uh, samples of bone from, uh, from, from these specimens. And what they did was they divided them up into three groups. They divided them up into three from Abydos, which had good evidence of TB macroscopically, and another group which they had uh, very minimal evidence of TB, and then a control group where there was no evidence on the bone structure that the patient, that the specimens had tuberculosis. So then it's qualified, it's, it's, it's graded here according to macroscopic evidence, and you can see this mirrors my previous uh, e uh, CT scan or MRI scan and macroscopic appearance. And the classical places would be like mid thoracic, lumbar vertebral body destruction, osteolysis of L4, and so on. This, the, the, they, used macros they used macroscopic appearance of the pelvis to, to sex the uh, specimens, as well as using uh, the Y gene and the amyloid gene, gene as well to identify um, uh, both the sex of the specimen as well as macroscopic appearance. So we have genetic evidence of sex as well as macroscopic appearance, and it worked in about nine out of ten of the cases that they did this study on. So what did they find? Well, they, they had to do this particular as a control to make sure the PCR reaction occurred. They took a common structural gene actin and then they just PCR that as well, a 202 base pairs, base um, pair fragment of uh, beta actin gene and showed that the PCR reaction was occurring in the samples that they did and there was no in, in interference or blocking agents in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the material that they sampled. So this is the amelogenin uh, uh, gene and neuropeptide Y showing sexing of the bones that they did the study on. This is the most interesting bit, and this is evidence on PCR that these uh, bones have suffered from tuberculosis. Now, what's interesting about it is this, is that they had nine positive cases of amplified TB of mycobacterium DNA present. Of the three groups they had, the first group had three in which there was macroscopic evidence of TB. Two of those were positive, but one was negative, showing that there is still problems with doing PCR to identify tuberculosis. In those group, in the group that they had minimal changes, um, two, uh, in the minimal changes, five or six of them were positive. But in the group that they had no changes and no evidence of TB whatsoever, two of the four had mycobacterium. So this is a wonderful development or discovery because it shows that you can actually identify TB in ONG specimens without actually having evidence from the macroscopic appearance of the bone. And finally, the most interesting bit I found was that in Abydos, the pre-dynastic necropolis, 
two of the three specimens from there had tuberculosis. So that and they, that particular Ibidos was 1,500 years older than the Thebes and Acropolis. So we have TB going back 4,000 years in Egyptian times. What are the limitations? Well, of course, some of the ones with macroscopic appearance of TB were negative. The second thing is that we, we only five to five percent of of people who get tuberculosis or if you look at the King series have osseous involvement in TB. So there's a huge underreporting of tuberculosis in ancient times, and I'm certain that it was a major cause of death in ancient times. Did it, well, major cause of illness in the ancient times, major cause of death, another question, why? Because people only lived in pre-dynastic times 20 years, and in later times, uh, pre-Roman times, pre-Roman Greek times, about 30 years of age. So maybe they had tuberculosis, but maybe they died from pneumococcus. Maybe they died from schistosomiasis. Nobody is quite sure that the TB was the actual cause of death. We have identified it in different times, but as the actual cause of death, because it's a chronic illness, you can have TB five or 10 years, and they may have died from other illnesses that they acquired because of the environment that they lived in. And that is the end of my talk. In conclusion, we have a very good uh, written evidence and uh, evidence from the uh, from monuments, from the temples of medical practice in Egypt. We have names of doctors like Imhotep who have got great reputation and is the father of medical practice. We have evidence of female doctors. We have evidence of medical practice and based on the papyri we've looked at, of which unfortunately we've only looked at two today which have been highly informative about how complex and how advanced the Egyptian doctors were. Their limitation was surgery. They didn't do surgery or weren't as brave as surgeons as the Romans were, which of course the Romans were, they did some pretty good things like moving cataracts and taking renal stones out. And we have two case histories, finally, that show the evidence of tuberculosis in ancient times. One in a Granville mummy where the diagnosis of the cause of death was incorrect and has now been confirmed by modern chemical and molecular biological techniques. And another one comparing two uh, necropolises in Egypt, one in Abydos and one in Thebes West, which were separated by 1,500 years of, of history, showing tuberculosis existed in both places. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor John. Now time for questions. There is one question from uh, Jamal Hashim, and he is asking if there is any evidence of organized medical education in the old kingdom. And I think he's referring here to the Nubi kingdom and the kingdom that you have mentioned. Yeah, at the that's a good question. Of your presentation. <laughs> It's a good question. It's a very good question. We have evidence from the Greek or Roman period of a medical school. They didn't call it the medic. They didn't call it a medical school. They call it the, the academy in the Library of Alexandria. We have evidence from there. Prior to that, it is thought that the medical teaching occurred in the temples. The temples were places where people went when they were ill. It was probably some of it was magic, some of it was priests, as we would nowadays you go to Lourdes, you go to Loch Derg, you go to the priest if you're sick to get blessed and so on, when the hope of you that you would survive and get better. And the Egyptians were no different. You know, they had a religion, they had priests, they had temples, they had sacrifice, they had ritual, and the treatment of illnesses um, uh, and the teaching of the treatment of medicine, of medical problems, that probably occurred in the temples. We don't have much evidence for it, it's all conjecture. Um, but a lot of the doctors that were uh, practicing medicine were also priests in the temple as well. So maybe that's where it happened. The evidence in later times in Greek and Roman times, which is, is much more solid uh, to identify the medical, medical education as such. Uh, thank you, Professor um, uh, John. I have a question uh, since there is no okay. more questions from uh, the audience. And no that the history most of the time is informing uh, the current and the future. Uh, my questions around the um, the old practices that you came across from the papyrus. Is there any practices that was very common? You mentioned some of them, you know, uh, putting red meat on the wounds using uh, gold wire to fix, you know, dental problem. Were there any practices that were very common during the you know, ancient uh, Egyptian medicine that formed the basis and the foundation 
for modern medicine? Yes, that's an excellent question. That is an excellent question because this is what this is why if you were Egyptian, you should be proud because the whole basis of Greek medicine, which is the basis of Islamic medicine subsequently, is based on what the Egyptians developed and 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 and, and dissected out in, in, in intellectual academic terms. So we can thank the Egyptians not only for the pyramids and their complex culture and the wonderful art, but we can thank them for subsequent advancement in made by the Greek Roman period, but also when you come to the Middle East. When we were running around in bearskins and sheepskins in Europe, the Middle East was the centre of intellectual life, of medical advances by Abyssina uh, and so on and so forth. And not only that, it was also the centre of the advancements of intellectual life, philosophy and so on and so forth. And you have got to go over to Islamic or um, to Moorish Spain to see wonderful examples of medicine as well. And Egypt, Moses Maimonides is one of the great Jewish physicians who was the physician to Salim and the Caliph in, in, um, in Egypt. And he has written extensive treatises on philosophy, on the Torah. He was also a rabbi and, and all his patients he made no discrimination. They were they were Muslims, they were Jews, they were Christians, and so on and so forth. And it's interesting, uh, Hussein. He uh, he's written a prescription once. I have a book at home on uh, prescriptions, uh, written in Hebrew. So the patient is a Muslim that goes to see Moses Maimonides, who's given a prescription written in Hebrew to the apothecary, who's also Jewish. And the poor old patient has no idea what the two Jewish guys are, are are handing out to him, but the money the money is between the two Jews, and the poor old uh, Muslim patient is paying his cash out, and he has no idea what these guys are giving. But it was wonderful to see how the prescription was written in Jewish for an Islamic patient uh, in in Cairo, you know, many years ago. And most my modern days is a beautiful statue of him in in Cordoba. But I think we have to understand that the wonderful advancement of Islamic culture in the Middle East at the time it happened, is very much dependent on what happened in Egypt 2000 years ago. Yeah, I think I do agree that as a human, we learn and we built our practices on uh, previous, uh, uh, previous life. The work of the you know, uh, previous uh, people and previous generations. Uh, yeah. There is no more questions from uh, okay. audience. God bless. Like, uh, Good bless. Thank you uh, both speaker Dr. Farib Al-Durazi and Professor John for uh, starting uh, the first uh, um, webinar for this uh, uh, academic year. We will have more uh, webinar uh, coming up in the future and we will be communicating uh, these webinars to you very soon as soon as we get the approval from Higher Education Council. We plan to have one uh, webinar each month we will not have one on December uh, due to the you know uh, end of the year and Christmas break. Uh, hopefully you will have uh, one more uh, or the second webinar in January 2022. Uh, so before I close, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor Rebecca to have a few words. Thank you very much, Hussein. Um, just to say a big thank you to both of our speakers, Dr. Fariba and Prof. John. Fascinating, different talks, but both fascinating uh, and very informative. So I've thoroughly enjoyed uh, the evening. And uh, just to say a big thank you to those that have presented and those that have attended. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I'll see you very soon. Take care.